When you speak about this level three, this contribute happiness, you often cite Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl. Can you tell us his story and how he illustrates this level three happiness? Basically, uh, Viktor Frankl's in a prisoner of war camp and, um, you know, in Auschwitz. And uh, while he is there, he begins to glean some lessons. He's, he's a psychiatrist, and he was previously a psychiatrist with some Freudian leanings. Uh, but he changes his mind um, as he's, um, you know, sort of surviving in this camp. Because he notices that really there are two kinds of prisoners, those that are investing themselves in others, those that are thinking about, man, when I get out of here in the future, uh, I'm going to tell people all about this so that this never happens again. Or if I have a crust of bread that I think I can spare without dying, I'm going to give that to this man, even though I crave it with all my heart right now. Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to help people get along. What he found in the camp was people like that. And we'll talk about the spiritual proclivity in just a moment. But that's another one, too, that's very important. He said, we become much more than the uh, what you might call the mechanistic view of human beings that his predecessor, Sigmund Freud, had, right? So uh, Freud was very much, uh, you know, about repressed libidinal instincts, you know, mechanistic view of the human person, et cetera. And um, Frankel, looking in the camps, you know, he begins to say, it's not anything like this at all. And then he begins to discover who lived and who died. The people who just focused on themselves and just said, I'm going to hold on until the Allies liberate us at Christmas. Then the Allies didn't liberate them at Christmas. And they would literally die. They would die because their whole purpose, right, was to simply get liberated and get out of this torment. They died. Many of them died. Not all, but many of them died. And many of them were really transfixed by um, the, the depression, the malaise that they felt in the camp until the point where they just kind of lost hope. Alternatively, the people who really focused on other people or focused on their family and what they're going to do for their family when they get out, or focused on what they're going to say to the world about this horrible condition and how it happened and so forth so that it'll never happen again. All those people, why they kept living. And even though it was just as cruel for them, at the end of the, the day, they survived the camp. And so um, basically, Frankel said, you see, it's not just, um, un, you know, get, getting rid of, you know, repressed libidinal instincts, right? The real thing is meaning, purpose, having some objective, an objective beyond myself. The whole idea of using the term contributive is it is beyond ourselves. And so if I'm living for my family, living for my friends, living to um, uh, make a difference to my church or to the kingdom of God or to my workplace or organization or the students in the workplace or the organs or to the, you know, my um, uh, a community, you know, uh, being a coach of a little league team and just giving some kids a great sense of their talent and lovability and goodness, uh, whatever it may be, the more we do that, the more our purpose is filled with this sort of very difficult to identify spirit. Mm -hmm. But it's a spirit, said uh, Frankel, that makes you live longer, that makes you more productive as you're living longer, that makes you more sensitive in your interaction with others as you're living longer. This spirit, you might say, well, it's really intangible. I can't put my finger on it. True enough intangible as you look straight on, but you can see it, as Aristotle would say, through its effects. 